And all right, everyone, thank you very much for uh, coming to this talk. My name is uh, Louis. I work in MyHeritage. And uh, today I'll be telling you guys about some of our work with um, like genomic predictions and uh, some of our techniques. So there's two main goals for this talk. Uh, the first one is to get you guys excited about doing like, machine learning or deep learning in genomics. And there's many reasons to be excited about that. Like, the first one is the sort of like, I think it's like a uniquely challenging data scale. So like, so for each example, you might have like tens of millions of features and they are not sort of like particularly like sparse, which creates like a lot of challenges. Uh, another reason to be excited about it is that, uh, at least in my opinion, this sort of like very like early days in doing machine learning or deep learning in genomics. And you have like the opportunity to really develop techniques which are tailored for uh, genomics. And the third reason, uh, which probably like, should be like the chief reason, uh, is actually like the potential to improve like people's lives by allowing them like to understand themselves better. Uh, and the secondary goal for this talk is to describe like some of our approach, but that's uh, really like the first one is mostly like, to give like an overview of the field. So this talk will happen in three parts. In the first part, we'll be talking about heritability and genomic predictions and why like we should care about them. In the second part, we'll give like a brief introduction to DNA as well as the data format. And in the third part, we'll be describing our methods. Okay. So uh, before we start, uh, I'll give a brief introduction to MyHeritage as well. So my, MyHeritage uh, is essentially like a genealogy company, uh, which means that like up until a year ago, it focused on being like a platform on which you can save and further research your family history. So like a lot of people might have used it uh, when they were doing like a Fudat or Hashim or something like that. And uh, this is sort of like a snapshot of the company right now. We are over like 400 people, over 500,000 like paying subscribers, over 90 million users, and over 8 billion historical records. So these historical records, they can be like user inputted data. So for example, like you might put your, uh, the birth date or the birth location of your great grandparents or something like that, as well as other kinds of historical records from different databases. <laughs> So, um, and these historical records, they are updated like frequently and there's always like new additions. So like one example uh, that was added like in January is all these different collections. So like different like newspapers and uh, on which you can find like information about your family as well as like different kinds of applications. So one uh, particular interesting one that was added in January was all the applications for immigration to British Palestine uh, within a period of years uh, before independence. So, uh, one of the records over there is sort of like this uh, young man who uh, by then was called like Shimon Tversky and uh, that was like his application so you guys can also like find uh, relevant information about you know your um, antecedents uh, in this or in other databases. Uh, and uh, since sort of uh, DNA has a lot to do with your heritage, uh, about one year ago my heritage started doing DNA tests uh, and it was then the science team uh, which in part was found and uh, we're doing like several things. Uh, one is uh, part of like the ethnicity estimate that you get as, uh, as part of your, uh, as one of the products. So with that you can sort of like understand like what fraction of your DNA comes from like which of the supported ethnicities. So we have like 42 available right now. And uh, the guy that actually developed most of it is sitting there if you guys have any specific questions. And uh, another thing is genetic matches, which I don't have a snapshot for here now but that you can find uh, which people that have like consent and that are interested in finding genetic matches for which you share uh, DNA. So for example, you can go and find sort of like some like long lost sibling as well as like a really distant relative. And um, this is one example of the ethnicity estimate going back. And the third goal of the science team is to do like long term like research that doesn't have to have specific product utility. Uh, so like in the same sense that just based on your DNA, you can understand a lot about uh, your like ethnicity, so to say, which says a lot about like where your family likely has been in the past like several hundred years. Like, what else can we say? So, like, can we predict other types of traits? So, uh, it is sort of like in this like researchy context that uh, this talk fits. All right. So, let's talk about like heritability and genomic predictions now. So, let's start with uh, with an example. So, let's say we have uh, Frank and Molly, okay, and they have two kids of their own, Ben and Lisa. All right, so let's say that Frank is 185, Molly is 175, and Frank has a like high LDL or like the bad cholesterol, and Molly has like normal cholesterol. Now, like we can ask like a few questions. So, uh, I don't, like, uh, what do you guys think? Like, do you think that there is more than 50% chance that uh, their son Ben 
will be over like 190 tall. Like, what, what do you guys think? No? Okay. <laughs> uh, what about uh, the chance that Lisa will have like the high uh, LDL cholesterol? The, like, why is it hard to make like to uh, ask like these questions about like genomic predictions? Like, I think it's fairly obvious, but like, what, why is it hard? Right, they're very complex, right? And they're not also like uniquely like genetic, right? So like the fact that Frank has like high cholesterol is not uniquely a product of his, uh, of his DNA, but it's also of like all kinds of other like environmental things, right? So this, um, and that's sort of like the, um, the thing, like we want to understand like what percent of like the variance in a specific trait has to do with your DNA and how much of it has to do with the environment. All right, uh, and this is like perfectly explained in the following like cartoon, right? Which the, this lady's like weight problem is partly genetic and partly a uh, Boston cream pie. And um, that's, uh, so the question is sort of like, how heritable are these traits in a quantitative uh, sense? So um, like one like big challenge, like how can you even like measure like heritability, right? Like if you want to understand like the effect of something, you have to be able to control for like all the other things, right? So how there's like so many things that are like hard to like control for, right? When you want to make these kinds of comparisons, like so uh, one of it is sort of like the environment and the and your nutrition, right? This definitely like affects all kinds of things. Uh, your family, your uh, income and like healthcare, right? Like how much like accessibility to healthcare you have, as well as like prenatal effects, or sort of like what were your conditions like during like pregnancy, right? Like what your mother uh, ate, uh, like plays a big role in these things, or like all kinds of other conditions. So. Uh, like, do you guys have any ideas for how to try to control for like all of these things together? I, I, I can say that I definitely did not, and I was quite puzzled by uh, by this before. What? Hmm? The question is like, uh, can you try to come up with an experiment that would control for like all these different types of uh, conditions to try to understand how heritable the specific trait is? Uh, twin studies is the answer. So uh, these have been done already like for like decades. And uh, what you do is that you compare perfect twins, all right? Those are twins that share 100% of their genes against regular twins, which are like, uh, genetically, they're pretty much like siblings. They compare, like regular siblings, they share only 50% of their genes. Uh, and what you do is, that, let's say, for example, for height, you can compare like the average, like the like empirical correlation between uh, perfect twins, right? Who share like the same environment, uh, but 100% of their genes, and you can compare that with the correlation with uh, regular twins. So, like, let's say uh, that you have sort of like um, like a 0.7 correlation among uh, perfect twins, but you have a 0.4 correlation among regular twins. So this means that there is a genetic component to this trait whenever there is this discrepancy. And uh, I'm perfectly skipping a few details here, uh, but uh, so like yeah, this controls for like family, income, healthcare, prenatal effects. Uh, as well as like environment and nutrition, because uh, you know unless something goes like wrong, like your twins should be eating the same thing. Uh, it's shown there. And um, uh, skipping a few details again, the with that kind of statistic, you can um, come up with these um, these estimates for like the variance explained by genetics for all these different traits. All right. So these are all from uh, from twist twin or like related studies. Uh, and this is sort of like how much of the specific trait is due to genetics. So like, so for some of these, uh, it's not surprising that genetics plays a big role, such as like height or like maybe like heart disease. But for some other ones, uh, I, I, I was like quite surprised. So for example, for like schizophrenia and depression, uh, I, I think out of like pure ignorance, I used to think that they were sort of like entirely like environmental traits in the sense that like what you went through like in life, somehow like uh, made you more or less likely to develop these conditions, but uh, it's actually they have a very strong genetic component to them. And uh, just to give you like a sense of like what like these numbers means. So for like schizophrenia, which is like a really like horrible like disease, like it, I think less than like 0.5% of the pop general population has it. But if you have a perfect twin and that twin has it, that I think raises your chances of having schizophrenia to something like 30 plus percent, right? So like, um, it has a very strong genetic component. Um, all right, so we have that some traits are heritable, and um, 
there is also like the following fact, which is uh, like named like the missing heritability, which is a fact that most algorithms they have not explained that much variance, right? So, for example, like for breast cancer, let's say that 35% of it should be explained by genetics. So that means that ideally there is some algorithm out there which can predict your likelihood to have breast cancer and achieve like that upper bound on accuracy, which is dictated by the 35%. And the fact is that for like the vast majority of traits, we are like very far from that. So this is like the missing heritability like issue. And the hope is that like big data and all kinds of techniques can sort of like close that gap. And uh, for this talk, we'll be talking about like height prediction because that's uh, something that like at our company like we have been to have like a relatively like large data set for uh, with like not a lot of noise. So uh, we'll be talking about like estimating height. All right, so, um, but I guess like first we should ask ourselves, like why should we care to predict um, these traits um, at all? So one reason is that people can take proactive action, right? So I think a really good example for this is, um, I think you guys probably can't read, but this is uh, Angelina Jolie's uh, op-ed in the New York Times in 2013, in which she, uh, she wanted to describe like her thought process for why she decided to, um, to do a mastectomy which means like a breast removal. So she was diagnosed with an 87% chance of developing breast cancer. That was like partly genetic and partly from family history. And what this allowed her to do was to make the decision to like remove um, her breasts, which like drastically um, decreases like her chance of breast cancer. So this is one example of proactive action that people can take. Uh, a second one is uh, personalized medicine. So if uh, like a drug manufacturer can understand like which people are more or less likely based on genetics to develop to respond well to a specific drug, uh, they can like essentially like, give like better uh, medicine. And uh, this is like very like real and this will be real in the future. And the third more far-fetched, uh, or at least for now it's a bit more futuristic, is CRISPR, which is a technique for genome editing. Um, so this was a uh, thing developed like in the relatively like recent past. And uh, what this allows you to do is to uh, just edit specific letters um, in your DNA. So this wasn't a possibility like at all before, uh, and it has already like been um, done in animals. Uh, so like one example of this is uh, as crazy as it sounds is uh, this dog, which was uh, genetically made to look like a lion. All right, and this is a joke. This is actually from Purim. Uh, if you guys want to, uh, you can buy a uh, costume for your dog there. Um, all right, but this is not a joke. This is a dog that was uh, genetically changed uh, in his like muscle genes, so to say, to develop a lot of muscles, right? So um, I think I don't hear a lot of laughs now. Um, and uh, yeah, this is like relatively like scary and dangerous, and that's why it hasn't been done in humans yet at a, at a great extent, but it will very likely be a possibility in the future. So um, these are like a few reasons why genomic predictions are important. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that like genetic predictions are important. So like, now let's give like a brief introduction to DNA as well as like the data format. So um, essentially, like DNA can be seen as a really long array of letters, where the letters are A, C, G, or T. That's sort of like the alphabet of uh, genetics, and it just happens that your DNA is split in like 23 chromosomes, one of which you get from your dad and one of which you get from your mom, uh, and they're like relative sizes or something like this. And sort of like, and uh, it will come sort of like in this format, and uh, just like some terminology here. So like when we refer to a SNP, that's a feature essentially, like in the model. So like, so for example here, uh, in this like chromosome, we can say that like the disposition in this specific chromosome, uh, that's a SNP, okay? And the value of that feature is an allele, right? So uh, that's that's the temperature. So the point sort of like. SNP is a feature, and the allele is sort of like the value of that feature as far as the model is concerned. <laughs> and uh, each of these can be like hundreds of millions of letters long. Um, and when you add them all the chromosomes together, it's something on the order of like 3 billion features, right? Which is quite uh, hard. Just to give you like a computer science perspective, it can be hundreds of millions of letters long. Uh, and if you try to put like, let's say it was like one bit per um, Per letter, this would be something on the order of like a gigabyte for a person, right? Which is uh, which is quite a lot. And uh, but the points are like, despite this is not like all bad news, and like despite all of our differences in like color and, uh, and shapes, um, it actually turns out that 
over that we are like more than 99% the same. So if you take like any uh, like two people, uh, over like 99% of their SNPs will be the same. So there isn't like all that much like difference among us, which means that we only need to sample a small fraction of your genome. So uh, so we actually uh, we only sample something on the order of like a million uh, like SNPs. And uh, and on top of that, there is like some like data like enrichment techniques. Um, that like at the end of that you might have something on the order of like tens of millions of features per person, which is still like quite challenging. Right. So um, I want to tell you guys like quickly about like the sort of like the lab work. Uh, I actually don't understand it like too well, so we'll go fast. <laughs> um, so the way it works is that you order a kit at home and then you like swab your like cheek for like cheek cells and you put it back in the tube. You send it to the lab. At that point, it's like extracted and like placed on a chip. And uh, at this point, sort of like some magic that I don't understand happens. Um, essentially, like the fluorescence pattern of that chip, uh, you can like read data from it. So uh, essentially, like let's say that this dark spot here, it might that maps into a specific value of that SNP. Okay, and like the light green will map into a different value. And uh, at the end, what you have is. Uh, a NumPy matrix, if you guys want, uh, where like each row is like one person, and uh, the numbers they will be like zero, one, or two. Um, and um, I won't go into the details so much, but essentially, like it's if it will be a zero, if uh, both of your chromosomes for that position they have the most common letter at that position, right? So let's say that like a, for, a for a specific position, you have an A. <coughs> and A is the most common letter in that position for the general population, then we'll have a zero. And if you have a, like a C there for, uh, for both parents, then you have a two, which is like the... And if you have like a one A and one C, you have a one. Uh, so if you like those are in the last couple of minutes, the important thing to understand is just that essentially like you will summarize your DNA data as this like long array of zero, ones, and twos. All right. Any questions here? It's a lot of data, right? You don't know which, if it's really A, C, or T. You just know if it's common with the other population or not. Uh, you also know if it's an A, C, or... Uh... You just have the indication if it's matching the general population or not, but you don't have the actual value. We also have the actual value, yeah. So I, I, I skipped that part, okay. but, but you also have the, uh, the actual value. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm not focused on, on SNPs, not for the epigenetics, or... Uh... For now, only SNPs. What's up? Can you be sure that two places, like two features for the same, for two persons, no, sorry, the same place in the vector for two people would, would mean the same feature? Like, how can you be sure of that? Uh, that's how, like, these chips are made, essentially. So, like, if they read the same thing, then they will have the same feature. There's, like, some amount of, like, genotyping error uh, with some, like, s small probability, but in general, like, you can expect them to mean the same thing. So, um, all right, so that's the, the data format, and uh, now I'll describe like, our methods. All right, so um, in order to like, understand like, really like, any type of uh, like, genetic like, models, like, uh, it's really important to understand like, something called like, linkage disequilibrium. So like, linkage disequilibrium like, it provides like, many challenges. Like, the first one is um, pronunciation, so we'll call it LD from now on. <laughs> and um, the second one uh, is that it's, what it means essentially is that uh, nearby, like SNPs, they tend to be inherited together, which leads to really large blocks of correlated features. Okay, so the uh, essentially, like if two SNPs are nearby together, like physically, they tend to be to be in very high correlation to each other. So uh, you might this is an example of a like a correlation matrix. Let's say you have like one thousand consecutive SNPs. Okay, and so this is like a thousand by thousand matrix, the correlation matrix. And so you might think that the correlation matrix might look something like this, uh, in which like the off-diagonal entries, they are like some positive number. And that's a fine guess, but in reality, it looks more like this. So this is an actual example, right? So um, what happens is that you have like these blocks. So for example, here you have this like square in the correlation matrix, uh, and then sort of like a sharp like fall, and then sort of like a new like square. So um, essentially like you have these like blocks of SNPs, um, that are in high correlation, and then sort of like, boom, and a new block of SNPs that are in high correlation. So this is actually probably like not the best example since like the population for this is like relatively like 
um, heterogeneous, but for like a more homogeneous population, this would look much more like um, actual blocks. Uh, and um, I think like LD is probably like the most, in my opinion, like the most distinctive uh, feature like in genetic data, and it's important to understand. So like some common solutions in the literature for how to deal with it, the one is just like removing correlated features. So uh, you can just like sort of like go in blocks, and then once you see something which is like not in correlation to the previous ones, you um, just like include that in your feature set. Uh, another one which has been done more recently is using like lasso against like a specific target function to let uh, in a supervised way like sparsify your data. Uh, and uh, there's like a couple of like issues with uh, with them. Like the first, but the, probably like, the most important one is that you end up like losing a lot of information. So. Uh, in the first one, like it's obvious, like why you're losing a lot of information. But even in the second one, against the target function, you uh, you're just like picking like SNPs that were like activated, like in Lasso, and the other ones are not basically like not really included at all, right? So uh, we'll try to tackle this in a in a different way that doesn't lose that information. Uh, and yeah, is this correlation consistent between samples? Like you always get the same snippet in every one, or is just like distance? Within like a homogeneous population, uh, it's fairly consistent, yeah. But if you have like very different populations, then it will um, won't be consistent. Great question. Yeah. Do they use something like uh, location sensitive hashing to get? Because it seems that if, if the correlation has to do with a distance and location sensitive hashing could. We 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 haven't tried that. So uh, so how do we handle LD? Uh, so like one like common like. Um, tool like in machine learning to uh, do dimensionality like reduction and to remove correlated features. This is sort of like blindly perhaps like apply like PCA. So like as a first uh, step in your algorithm you can apply PCA and that will give you like a set of uncorrelated features. Right? And uh, so the, the points are related to PCA helps you create like independent features. So we might think so like uh, can we use it in order to, like to summarize that uh, LD structure into a much lower dimensional space. So um, that's what we do. And uh, so let's look at like a, an example of how PCA actually like acts on, um, on on such data. So this is a synthetic example, all right, of uh, like an idealized like correlation matrix in like perfect LD. So we have here like this is 300 by 300, uh, and we have like six LD blocks, each of like 50 SNPs each. Okay, and uh, so the correlation matrix will look something like this, and. Um, Let's, uh, so before we talk about what PCA will do, let's just like quickly like recap what PCA does in a nutshell. So if you have like a data matrix X of like N by P, so like N examples and P features, and the target number of components to which you want to, um, uh, that's the number of features you want at the end, PCA can find the P by K matrix, uh, we'll call it V, such that when you apply V to X, it maximizes variance. So it's sort of like find, it's a finding a matrix to which you can multiply your data matrix such that the smaller, uh, and the key here of course is that uh, K should be like much less than P uh, in order to dimensional reduction. And, uh, and that will like preserve the most information, okay? And uh, V, uh, it's called like the, the matrix of like principal directions and they happen to be the right singular vectors of X but that's not important for us. Uh, so. Let's, uh, so this is like one uh, example like we did on uh, sklearn because the data scale is fine here. And uh, so this is actually the matrix V, okay, after computing PCA. So that's the matrix of components to which you can multiply uh, your data matrix X. So uh, one, you know, sort of like feature of this is that like it clearly captures like the block structure in the data, right? Like it clearly like understands that uh, this data comes in like a lot of blocks of correlated features. And the uh, second thing is that like, you can try to interpret it as, um, so like the third one over there is just uh, highlighting like the large values, so to say. So like may, maybe like that first principal direction here. So these two rows, um, it looks like it's capturing some kind of summary of what's going on in this last LD block here, right? Uh, let me give you guys a moment to try to digest that. Let me know if there's any questions. So don't you assume that the data come from a normal distribution? Normally distributed? Um, that's not necessary for, yeah, like, that's not a, like maybe you can prove something extra if the data comes normally distributed, but uh, it's 
time in general. So this is an example of applying like PCA on the real data that uh, we had before with the real LD. And uh, you know, there is like a lot more like noise over here, but again, you can see that like that first uh, principal direction there. It's also like somehow like capturing the sort of like some kind of summary of that uh, one LD block. So the point is like PCA is a good place to start if you want to summarize your data. Uh, and uh, it comes in this um, sort of like you know matrix multiplication format, which is like very handy if you uh, if you want to do like deep learning, right? Um, and that's what uh, what we're going to do, right? So summary is like PCA helps with LD because it captures the block structure of the data and it somehow like summarizes the information that's in these uh, LD blocks. Okay. All right. So uh, let's talk about our technique. So what we'll do is that we'll build a two-layer uh, network. Uh, which is like a standard something like this, okay? So we have like the 1,000, and furthermore, like we'll do this, we'll do like one different model for different consecutive blocks of a 1,000 SNPs, okay? So we'll take like a 1,000 consecutive SNPs and we'll build a, bod a model on that. So we have like 1,000 SNPs as features and then the output layer will try to predict height. All right, so... Um, we we'll make some like standard choices here, like we're using uh, ReLU activations and initialization. And uh, the non-standard thing that we do here um, is that we compute the PCs and then we use that PC matrix V to initiate, to initialize the first layer in the network. So instead of letting A1 be initialized like randomly, sort of like it's typically done, we actually like force it to start with the values of that uh, matrix V, right? Which are like the singular, the right singular vectors of the data matrix. So what this is doing is essentially like, uh, because we know a priori that the data will have this LD structure, it's essentially like forcing the network to start by already knowing this information about the LD blocks, right? There's no reason to let it uh, get lost and wild trying to capture that. We can just like force it to start with that. And, um, and then sort of like during the optimization, uh, it can learn sort of like if a specific LD block is not relevant for that uh, trait, it will learn like to downweight that. And if a specific SNP in another LD block, for example, is particularly relevant, it will learn to update that. So essentially like it's warm starting the network uh, with that LD structure and, uh, and then like letting it uh, sort of like take it from there. And uh, just like a couple of notes here, like on some choices. So like we tried like with uh, different like depths as well and like two work fine, but also like we don't really priori expect to have like a very complex nonlinear interaction. So sort of like a, two is like a fine choice for this. The point here is not to uh, try to capture some really uh, like exquisite interactions here because they don't happen too much as far as I know in biology. And um, Another, the choice for like doing this in blocks of consecutive SNPs versus trying to do it on the whole thing. Um, what is that also like you, a priori don't expect the, um, to have like really like far interactions with different SNPs. Okay, so like we expect like most of these interactions to be fairly local. And uh, this is like one of the things we've been trying. It seems to be working uh, well, but like we'll be trying like a lot of different iterations of this as well. All right, so um, the results is that like preliminary experiments have shown that it's like outperforming like linear models, okay, with these other types of feature selections that we talked about. And uh, it's still like, we still need to do some extra work to uh, make the performance numbers like comparable to other things because it depends on like the number of samples, it depends on the specific populations that you're doing this with. So uh, we'll be, you know, uh, We'll, we'll be doing this like in a publication later with all the, like, the actual like the performance details. Uh, the point is more like to give you guys like a taste of the sorts of approaches we've been doing here. Uh, I didn't ask if you guys have any questions about the, the setup here. Um, what is the target? What, is the, what are uh, the labels of the output layer? So uh, they are like they are the heights of people. So uh, we just for completeness, we don't use the actual heights. We use sort of like the z scores of the height. Uh, conditioned like on uh, gender and ethnicities and, and things like that. So uh, some uh, transformation of people's heights and that's what we actually try to predict. Can you explain again why, what did you mean by block, working on blocks? Yeah, so uh, essentially like the initialization that we're making for the first layer 
uh, is of the values of the you know that PC matrix, and uh, what happens essentially like that maybe like that first component over there it's like like the first feature in the second layer like will be some kind of summary of this. So like when I say it's working on blocks, um, it's uh, I think actually you're asking something else. I just realized uh, you're talking about like the 1,000 SNPs. Uh, yeah. So uh, by like block, I mean that uh, we create a different model for each uh, set of like 1,000 consecutive SNPs. That's, that's what I mean. Sorry? Like meaning you have like six different models or something like that? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, so it will be like if, let's say, our feature set has like one million features, then this will be like 1,000 different models. And how do you do like average over them? Uh, yeah, so like we're still like trying different things, but uh, I think right now the latest thing I tried was just doing like lasso on the on the predictions of the of the of them, or, or just averaging or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is your, uh, loss function. Uh, we're doing like mean squared error of the of the z scores. Yeah. Sliding window, it doesn't uh, intersect. It, it's a very good question, and like, we'll, uh, for simplicity, we did not uh, have like sort of like different intersect. We just have like disjoint uh, sets of SNPs, which is like losing a lot of information. So uh, that's something we're trying to future as well. Uh, yeah. Why, why don't you increase number of layers to increase number of networks? Uh, increase. C could you say that again, please? You can increase number of uh, hidden layers and uh, uh, feed the system with higher uh, order of uh, input features, with minimum features. You do some sort of deep learning. Uh, well, like, I think like um, the increasing like the number of layers, at least like in the experiments we tried, didn't really help too much because we a priori don't really expect to have like these like really complex interactions, but. To I know that's something I like, could we'll try again in the future again. The I think sort of like the honest point is that in the beginning this makes it a lot easier to do because of the data scale, and the second point is that again we don't expect to have sort of like uh, these like really like far interactions with different parts of the chromosome. So like if we can ca capture things locally. First, at least, this will capture like most of the um, of the information. But do you want some kind of isolate? Isolate. What do you mean? Uh, you say you want some locality. You want to isolate these features as one thing blocks from each other. Why can you use them in one network? Uh, well, like one was for simplicity of trying this like at first. Okay, and uh, I think we'll be trying also wait with different like instead of one K, but something like more or less. But the, the point is like if you know a priori that like it's very unlikely that like some really far away SNPs will have any meaningful interaction, then uh, you know maybe you won't be losing like, too much information, and this can train uh, maybe this will be able to like converge more quickly. Yeah. yeah. You said you have performed the linear model, but can you give us an idea of the scale of accuracy that you get? This is question one and question two. Did you try, uh, is 1k arbitrary or not? And if yes, did you try other uh, lengths of work? And did it change dramatically or not at all the accuracy of the over average of the whole Yeah. So the, the 1k here is like fairly it's arbitrary. It's arbitrary in the sense that like there's no great reason to have like one k over like two k. Uh, but we actually haven't tried too much. But like the point is sort of like that the beginning and the end of that one k they will like be like very uncorrelated. So we wanted to make sure that like the LD blocks will be um, that we have like several like LD blocks in there. And for the first question, like we've been um, comparing essentially comparing against. Um, uh, against another like paper that came out recently to predict height and it what it does essentially like uh, it prunes the values first by p-value and then it does lasso so uh, I tried to compare it with that but the, um, the numbers right now like um, I'm having a hard time comparing them because the data sets they are of very different sizes so um, if it's okay, like uh, a way to like actually like say I, I don't I want to make sure that I'm not saying anything. Like twenty percent, more like ninety percent. Just to have an idea. Ah, dif the difference in performance. It's yeah, more, more like twenty percent. 
if uh, it, yeah, it's not. <laughs> the the the. Yes, again, just an ID. If it's more seventy or more ten. Uh, it was well, 70 would be like pretty much the whole thing. So like the data set that we're doing here actually has something like 20,000 people only, all right? So uh, with 20,000 people, there is like no like hope of uh, getting like that much accuracy. So it's closer to 10 than to, uh, to 70. And, uh, but with like much larger data sets. So like actually in that last paper, they show the difference in performance like as you increase the data set. So like they had something like 15, um, R square of 0.15 with 20,000 people, but with 500,000 people, they had of like 0.45 uh, or something like that. So um, it changes a lot, and we want to make sure the numbers are comparable. Uh, yeah. Normalize the features. The yeah, we uh, we normalize the um, yeah, we normalize the features before doing uh, C scoring. Uh, we just do, uh, I think, the scale. I don't remember exactly like what is the latest thing, but I think it's just to maybe we just center them. Uh, I can't remember exactly right now, actually. Yeah. Uh, for such a prediction, it's enough maybe to to use a sample of your data, not to use the data. And if it's a sample, so why people will upload new uh, uh, DNA data to you because you already have that. A model that works on a sample, and it's uh, I'm not sure if I understand. Okay, so you do you use a sample or, or, full, or use a full, a full data set to train this? Yes, uh, we well, like, so we have so, like, this data is coming from people that um, volunteer to participate in the study and they give the data. So, so it's, it's a lot of data, right? Okay, so yeah. So, next now is that you have a model, then there's no need to collect more. Uh, data for people because it's a lot of data that's already generalized for maybe the whole population. Uh, well, like this is like one of the you know the projects that we are doing. Like there's like other things that people are trying, and like and frankly, like, this is not like the most. Uh, this is not part of like the product, right? At all. So like um, so like we can for the ethnicity estimates, for example. It's always helpful to have like uh, like more like high quality data to be able to always keep improving the models. But for this specifically, it's almost like a side project now. All right, so uh, I've gone in a lot of time, so uh, let me uh, jump to the conclusion. So uh, there's a couple of other challenges. Like one is that uh, right now, like unfortunately, like most genetic data sets, they have like vastly more uh, like basically like people of European descent than anything else. And so if you train a model with that, it will tend to do well for those people, but not necessarily and likely not at all for other people. So one challenge is sort of like to ensure that like whatever uh, you're doing for people that are actually like doing this uh, and affecting people's lives, to ensure that it works for like that in an inclusive way. Uh, a second goal is to make these models more interpretable, to understand actual like mechanisms um, behind these uh, traits. And uh, so I hope I got you guys um, excited about like doing machine learning and genetics. I'm happy to talk more. If you want to get started, there is a few of these data sets which you can um, uh, apply for, or like OpenSNP you can just get. And uh, or even better, you should uh, just like be in touch uh, if you want to learn more or if you have any other questions. So thank you very much.